time to start one of our final stoichiometry units. So far, we've actually managed to talk about two different types of stoichiometry. Um, stoichiometry that's relating to solids, where we start with grams and then convert to grams. And then also stoichiometry that involves liquids, where we might start with a unit of liters and then convert back to a unit of liters. So what we've really found is that the unifying theme about all stoichiometry is that we first need to figure out how to convert into moles. And then once we're in moles, we can apply a mole to mole ratio. And that's exactly what we're going to see here in this chapter as we examine our next state of matter and then apply it to stoichiometry, gases. So first of all, let's start at the very beginning and kind of refresh our memory about what a gas is really all about. So states of matter, you've probably learned about these for a really long time, but it never hurts to kind of review. Going back to a solid, a solid you can see is all, all the atoms are arranged in a nice fixed crystal pattern. They're all kind of sitting next to each other. They might be wiggling back and forth a little bit, but they're really not moving across the container. So we say that it's a nice rigid fixed shape and that it has a very fixed volume that can be measured quite easily. And what's really important about this is that we really can't compress or squash that material at all. Those atoms are spaced exactly where they would like to be. Almost the same thing can be said as a liquid. Now in a liquid, the crystal shape has broken down and the molecules can move from one side of the container to the other by slipping past another atom, but they're still pretty close together. It's not rigid, it's not a fixed shape. However, it does have a fixed volume that you can measure. And because it has a fixed volume, we also say that it cannot be compressed either. So even if I squish it, the volume isn't going to change. Now what makes a gas a little bit different? you can see that the atoms are further spaced apart. They don't need to slip or kind of squiggle past each other just to try and go from one side of the container to the other. Um, they can also completely fill the container. So we say not only is it not a rigid shape, and it doesn't necessarily even have a fixed volume, and unfortunately because of that, gases can be compressed. And that adds an additional layer of difficulty into our gases. So unfortunately, when we're dealing with gases and trying to figure out how do I even measure how much gas I have, it's not just going to be one easy measurement. We're going to need to actually take into consideration three measurements at the same time. A gas's pressure, its temperature, and its volume. More on that in a little bit, but first what I'd like to examine is this new unit of pressure. What is pressure and how do we measure it? Well, pressure is actually put pretty simply, but I thought it might be easier for you to see this in motion. So what I have here is a sample of a gas, and we just have it trapped inside of a rigid container. And you can see that the gas particles are in random motion on the inside of that container. Pressure is created when the little tiny particles strike the side of the container. Not necessarily when they strike each other, but when they strike the sides of the container. So just kind of frozen in place again, any time that those particles hit the sides of the container, we consider that to be pressure. Now, pressure obviously can be measured and has a unit that is associated with it. Well, some people use a pressure unit called atmospheres, some called pascals, torricelli, millimeters of mercury, kilopascals, bar, and pounds per square inch. And there's even more than that. It actually has to do with how and when gases were discovered and started to be measured. Um, it's kind of happened before information could be easily readily shared from one part of the world to another. So a whole bunch of different people started to develop the same idea at the same time. And because of that, they had to develop their own unit that went along with those numbers. So we still have many different units that we use in a variety of different applications. And it's going to be important to know how to interconvert between all of them. So this set of conversion factors you should definitely have down inside of your notes. Uh, that one ATM is also equal to 760 Tor, which is also equal to 760 millimeters of mercury, 14.69 PSI, 1.01 bar, 101,325 pascals, which is also equal to 101.325 kilopascals. And yes, there are more units of pressure that are out there, but this is predominantly the ones that you're going to see in this class and most of the time in chemistry. And again, it's going to be important for you to be able to interconvert between them. 
Now, one thing that people typically get confused with is thinking that if you start an ATM and you want to go all the way to the other end and convert something into kilopascals, that you have to go through every single other unit that's there. And that's in fact not the case. You can pick out any two of these numbers with units attached to them and they'll be equal to each other and you can make your own style of conversion factor. I definitely want to show you an example. So let's say we have a question which is how many tor of pressure are equal to 597 kilopascals? So first what you're going to want to do is take your given just like we always do and put it over one and your unit is going to want to fall to the bottom of the next box. But what I really want to convert is from kilopascals to tor. So I find kilopascals up in my giant equivalent statement, and I find that 101.325 kilopascals is the number that's going to be associated with the unit that falls down to the bottom of the next box. And what do I want to convert it into? Well, I want to convert it into tor. And that means that 101.325 kilopascals is also equal to 760 tor. So I'm going to put that on the top of my conversion factor. And then all I have to do is hit equals and I'm ready to go. And I find out with three significant figures, because I bring three significant figures in, that my final answer is 4,480 tor. Typically, the numbers that are given in the pressure conversions are not considered for significant figures. So again, it's going to be really important for you to know what these pressure conversions are. I will be providing them on a test or a quiz, but for the purposes of your homework, please do make sure that they're somewhere inside of your notes. One last thing before we completely give up on this topic, and this is something we're going to cycle back to um, at the end of this series, is this idea of how temperature kind of factors into this whole thing. I have two little snippets here for you that I just kind of want you to watch. This is a sample of a trapped cold gas. I just want you to observe how those particles are moving. And then here is a trapped sample of a hot gas. And I'm hoping what you noticed about how the two samples moved is that the cold gas particles are moving much, much slower than the hot gas particles. So just as a refresher, Temperature is officially defined as the average kinetic energy of the particles in a substance. So the particles were those little gas particles moving around. The cold ones were moving slower, and the hot ones were moving faster. So, and again, kinetic energy is kind of code for the energy of motion, or how they're moving. So the hotter they are, the faster they move. And that will be really important when we're trying to measure pressure. One more thing. In this chapter, we tend to use the temperature unit of Kelvin, and we will be getting into that a little bit as we push forward in this series. But for right now, Kelvin equals Celsius plus 273.15 degrees. Uh, we'll, I can we'll talk about that a little bit later on as we look at the interconversions between pressures, volumes, and temperatures. So again, the faster the particles move, the more frequently they're going to collide with the container. And how do we formally define collisions with the container? Ah, pressure. So the more collisions with the container, the higher the pressure is going to be. So temperature definitely matters. But what's also going to matter in our future conversation is the container itself. So there are generally speaking two different types of containers that we're going to contain gases in. We have rigid containers that don't have flexible sides. Their volume is set. And those that have flexible sides, like a balloon. So in a rigid container, your volume is going to be constant. It cannot change. But what can change is the pressure on the inside. In a flexible container, your volume can change because the sides can move in or out as necessary. The pressure here, though, tends to remain fairly constant. It's roughly equivalent to the pressure of the atmosphere, or the gas around the outside of that container. So, something to keep in mind as we move forward here, all three of these variables are very interconnected, and you're going to have to read your problems extremely carefully to try and figure out exactly what's happening to the little particles of the gas on the inside, whether you're dealing with a rigid container or a flexible container, or a hot gas, or a cold gas. 
is all going to be very, very critical. So again, pressure, temperature, and volume, all interconnected.